How are you doing? <laughs> Soul Deep's the first one in here. All right. <clears throat> two people already. Oh, two thumbs up. Well, I don't even know if anybody's in here. Good morning, everybody. Today's live stream, we're going to talk about prepping as you uh, travel internationally. A concern a lot of people might have is what are you going to do to be prepared if things go pear-shaped in the world? And they've you know, <laughs> they've been pretty funky, funky here lately. So first I wanna thank this month's sponsor on Patreon, Brian Castor. Thank you, Brian. And I also wanna thank uh, other patrons, Alex Tucker and Priyank Vashisht. This is on a Walmart. They do have Walmart in Mexico, guys. So uh, it's not a... It's not like you're going to be going to live in a cave if you're in Mexico, but let's talk about uh, being prepared. So, well, I guess I ought to wait until at least one person gets in here, huh? <laughs> so, uh, what's new in Mexico? Well, I got a new sponsor on Patreon, Brian Castor. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> and uh, I want to remind all of you guys... You can check the link in the description. If you want to become a patron, you get all kinds of bonus material. Like I've been working on this month's piece of artwork. Here's a little peek of the artwork for Brian. Uh, you get custom artwork mailed to you directly from Bo Burson. And you get to see the videos early without ads. You get custom videos made for you. You get all kinds of extras. You get exclusive content, like some videos that aren't even posted out there for everybody that are a little more personal or a little more uh, things I don't necessarily want to talk about on YouTube. Wow, I thought we'd have somebody in here by now. Where the heck did Soul Deep go? I think something weird happened with the stream, like it went on and off. Let me get on my other device here. Oh, that was like, he wrote a message a long time ago. Never mind. Well, we're just gonna get going, guys. I can't just sit here and make dead air. So the first thing, three things people normally think about when they're thinking about preparing, they've gotta have <clears throat> some extra water on hand, they've gotta have some extra food on hand, and they've gotta have some extra cash on hand because you could become cut off from uh, being able to use ATMs, banks might not be open, things like that if something really weird happened. So what spurred this topic is I got a, a message from a friend of mine who wrote uh, basically the question he asked was, when you're traveling, if you're cut off from your passport and from your income, what would you do? Because my income comes direct deposit from the bank. That's how I get paid for my rental properties. And if I was cut off from that, and if somehow, I don't know what would happen with the passport, but if I was unable to use that for whatever reason, what would I do? So that's what we start off with the three basic things that everybody thinks about that you gotta have on hand. This is called a garafon. It's a big water jug, 20 liters. And I've got several of these. So what happens is uh, when I'm down to my last one, I take the others down to be refilled. And then uh, I've got so many now that I used to carry these. People carry them. It's kind of cool how people carry these things. You can just carry it over your shoulder like that. These things are freaking heavy. This is 20 liters. So, you know, that's uh, something like 40 pounds. So now that I have more of those, I just take them to be refilled and they deliver them to me. So when I'm down to just one, I'll just walk down there with the empty ones and then leave them. And then I'll be exposed. I'll only have 20 liters on hand for a few hours, but then whenever they make it by here to drop them off, then I'm back up to like a month's worth of water again. Uh, and the other way I figure is if I ever got caught out with having some empty ones and was unable to get them filled up at the station, all I've got to do is boil water on the stove and I can refill them that way. I have tried boiling water here. 
I was really, uh, I'm really dedicated to my budgets and that's how I've had the success I've had with my properties and everything. I don't make a whole lot of money, but my amount I spend is like, well, it's ridiculous. We'll talk about that more in a minute when we talk about the money piece of this video, but I was down to the end of my budget one month and it may sound crazy, but I didn't even want to spend 10 pesos. It cost 10 pesos to refill one of these Garofones for 20 liters and they clean it. Every time you get it refilled, it's not like just going down to the Walmart to refill it yourself. I gotta check what that costs. It's gotta be even cheaper, but uh, when I take it to one of these outfits, usually they'll cost like 12 to 15 pesos. I found one that's a really good deal, a five minute walk away for 10 pesos to fill this. So that's not much, it's 50 cents, but I was down to the bottom of my budget. I didn't even have 10 pesos to refill it. So I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna, I only had a couple days left and I said, I'm just gonna boil water and make tea with it. So I did, I made a, I had some tea bags and I, I boiled a bunch of tea and put it in the fridge. I thought it'd taste better if I got it cold. It tasted really bad. I didn't even drink it. I figured out some way to scrape and be able to, <laughs> to refill my water because it was just funky. But in a survival situation or some kind of situation where I really didn't have a choice, I could always boil water on the stove to refill those things if I couldn't get down there to get them refilled. So that takes care of the water piece. Now the food piece, I've always got a lot of, I'm looking at probably on my shelf, a pound and a half of dry beans and close to a pound of rice and 300 grams of dried anchovies um, and about 18 eggs. But those, except for the anchovies, all require cooking. So it's important to have things on hand. Of course, canned food is really popular. Uh, meals ready to eat or uh, these kind of just add water type of meals are popular for people who are preparing. But the easiest thing for me to do here is just to keep some canned food on hand. So what I, what I do is whenever I go to the store, pick up an extra can of uh, canned food to tuck back. I'm just gonna pile that up to where they sell these big cans of, uh, I don't know, like 28 ounce cans of refried beans. I'll just pick up an extra one of those every time I go to the store and just stockpile them, end up with like uh, 30 of those or so. And that's something I like to use. What I'm probably gonna concentrate on are refried beans and sardines. I think those would both be really tasty to eat without heating them. And if I'm not mistaken, I do have a can opener, but both those can be opened without a can opener in case my can opener busted. <laughs> There's some real prepping for you. So that takes care of the food piece. And then the last, the third one that people think of is the most top three things like I showed in the thumbnail, water, food, and money. You gotta have money on hand. So as far as the budget stuff, I just, I spent the amount of money I spend here is kind of ridiculous, guys. It's so low. Uh, I've actually been living on less than $300 a month. That is my total budget, believe it or not. My apartment here is, uh, we'll just write it out on paper real quick. It's real simple. Uh, my apartment here costs 2,500 pesos, which is $125 a month. And then all I spend is 100 pesos a day. That's 3,100 pesos a month. <laughs> so that's only 5,600 pesos. There's my budget. 2,500 for rent, 3,100 for, uh, basically it's, all I spend money on is food and riding the bus around. I don't have any other bills now. I'm debt free. I don't have a vehicle. We're going to talk about that in Friday's video. Do I miss, do I regret selling my van? Um, so that's only 5,600 pesos a month. 
there's 20 pesos to the to the dollar so that's 280 dollars a month is my budget right now <clears throat> but i pull out 10,000 per month uh i have been getting to where i'm just doing one withdrawal a month uh actually for 9,000 uh 9,000 pesos, not 10,000. I misspoke there. So that's $450. And then that basically leaves me with, so after I pay my rent for 2,500 out of the 9,000, I'm only spending, I actually am trying to give myself a little more room, like 125 pesos a day instead of a hundred. But even then I'm like, <laughs> that's only 25% more than this. So that's something like less than 4,000. Uh, hey, Carlos, I'll answer your question in just a second. So basically after I pay my rent, I'm only spending about half of the additional pesos. So that's like uh, 150 I'm tucking away every month. So I've got, I'm accumulating a pile of cash in case of emergencies that could be used to try to get wherever I need to go, if I need to get in an emergency, if I need to get to an embassy, or I need to get to an airport, or I need to get wherever. I have cash for that. Now we'll talk about the side of prepping that people uh, might think about a little bit less, right after we answer Carlos's question. Carlos Contreras, do I invest in cryptocurrency? I am not invested in anything right now except for real estate. Crypto is something that interests me. Honestly, I have not learned very much at all about it. I don't even, I think understanding crypto might require, and Carlos can answer me on this. It seems to me like to understand how crypto works and may work because a lot of this is being figured out as it, because it's such a new thing being figured out as it goes. But my impression is that you got to kind of maybe have, if you have somewhat of an understanding of how the stock market works, then you have something to build on to understand crypto probably a little better. That's my impression. And I don't even really, I've got a loose grasp on how the stock market works. I kind of, you know, understand when a company goes public that they're selling shares of it and that it's representative of, I don't know, I get a little my brain, it tries to clamp onto things to the degree where uh, I just end up with more questions than anything. Here's a good quote for you guys. As the island of knowledge grows, so does the shore of ignorance. And that's how I am with the stock market. So I don't understand that stuff, but I, uh, I'm interested in learning more about it. Carlos asked another question. Also, I was wondering if you are still a U.S. citizen because it sucks paying double taxes. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so I guess Carlos might have dual citizenship. Congratulations, if that's the case. That's awesome. And that is, that is something I want to do, but I need to, what he just brought up is a very good point that I need to learn more about that if I pursue that avenue. Uh, or basically if I get a residency card here in Mexico, after living here in the country for five years, I could become a Mexican citizen without having to, uh, without having to, what's the word? When you let go of your US citizenship, uh, I could basically have two citizenships, United States of America and Mexico, United States of Mexico. So I'd have United States of two different things. Actually, I've seen on paperwork here, it's United States of Mexico as well. So I'd be USA and USM and have uh, passports for both countries. But like Carlos said, I'd be on the hook for double taxes. And right now in the US, I do not have to pay at my income level. This could change with the new properties I just acquired. But as of now, the last several years, I have not had to pay federal income tax because my income is so low. Soul Deep is back. How you doing, buddy? Uh, because basically in the U.S., I'm considered poverty level. But here in Mexico, I would not be. Um, but I don't know what the rule is. I mean, if I have 
dual citizenship, but my income is earned in the U.S., which even though I'm sitting here in Mexico making a podcast, but YouTube is considered a... YouTube is not considered me working in Mexico because it's outside of Mexico. Uh, would that not be the case for income tax? That's something I need to learn about. But yeah, I, uh, I would be interested in dual citizenship. And I am still, to answer Carlos's question specifically, I am a U.S. citizen, and that's the only place I am a citizen. So now we're going to jump into the thing with prepping that less people think about, but many view as the most important part. And I would probably consider myself in that group. Of course, you've got your basic necessities of life, uh, food, water, shelter, but those can be uh, taken away and those can be food and water can run out. So the thing that a lot of people say is most important is relationships, community, having people around who you can rely on, who can rely on you and you're part of something where if things go bad, it's good to have people around to help you if you need help and for you to help if they need help. Kind of a no-brainer, but a thing a lot of people forget about. And for me, as I travel, you guys know I try to do my tithing. I've had to lay off it when I was in debt the last year, but I'm debt-free again. I had took a loan for some property I just acquired and the loans paid off in one year instead of 30. And... Now I'm debt free again, so I'm gonna be looking at the tithing thing where 10% of my income is going to helping people where I am because as I was just discussing with Carlos and you guys, while the, while the US considers me to be poverty level here in Mexico, that income of a couple grand a month is a couple grand US per month is about what the pay would be for a doctor with 10 years experience. So certainly well above the average income level here. Um, so as I travel in places like that, it's important to remember that even though back in the US I would be poverty level, here in these other countries, I've got a, a lot more disposable income than the local folks might. So it's important to give something back where I go, especially if I'm, uh, my preference is rather than staying in the, uh, <clears throat> starting to lose my voice already, guys, sorry. If I'm, uh, I don't like to be in the heavily expat population places. I don't like to stay in the places that are really expensive and frou-frou. Um, I don't like to eat at the, foreigner restaurants, the expat restaurants with international food. I like to eat the local food with the local people, live in local type housing. Uh, yes, the building I'm in is probably considered a little bit fancy, but 125 a month rent, US dollars, come on. It's not, a, I could be spending 600, 800,000 here for a really uh, amazing place relative to what I would get in the US for that price. But I'm not, I'm staying in. And you know, the people in this building, uh, they are more professional types and uh, you know, students with wealthy families and that type of stuff. Uh, it's not just blue collar folks here in the building I'm in, but because I'm in the cheapest little shoebox apartment in the building, I'm paying a lot less. I'm paying pretty comparable to what a local may be paying for a space with just more room because I'm by myself. So locals usually are married or have a spouse or significant other. Often if they're above, you know, their early to mid twenties, they've got children, so they need more room and they would be, they would be paying as much for rent as I am. They would just have a bigger place. My point is, I'm spending a lot less than uh, a normal, typical expat would, but I still have the expat income. I recognize that, so I try to give back. But it ain't just financial. What I'm about to talk about, some of the things involve me buying something for somebody 
or doing something financial for somebody, but it's uh, it's not totally about the money. The tithing thing would be uh, more about the money and might be less relative to what we're about to discuss. We'll get into that. So what I've done, for example, where I live, when I visited the U.S. to reset my my visitor's card, uh, when I came back, I was just, uh, and this isn't totally unique to Mexico. This is a feeling I get. I've had this feeling with Malaysia. I've had this feeling with Thailand. Um, where you leave and you come back and you feel like you're going home because I've lived for long periods of time in both those places. When I visited India, I didn't stay so long. Um, but I had an apartment in Thailand for months and months. And when I went back, I would feel like, uh, hey, Soul Deep, we'll talk about that uh, citizenship some more in just a minute. Uh, when I came back to Thailand, to that apartment, I felt like I was going home. And I had that same feeling flying back into Mexico City here uh, a week or so ago. And <clears throat> Coles and Daisy, how you doing? So flying back into Mexico City, it felt like coming home. And when I got back to Puebla, I took the bus to Puebla and I was walking around the neighborhood, going to the grocery store and saw a couple folks who I knew and stopped and chatted for a minute. It's kind of funny when you, when you do the stop and chat uh, and you don't understand. <laughs> I don't know how much we really understand each other. My vocabulary is pretty good. I can pretty much figure out how to say just about anything with really poor grammar. I can communicate just about any thought, but that doesn't mean they're going to understand me. Uh, I could probably be better off if I wrote it down because my pronunciation and grammar are so bad that it can be difficult sometimes for them to understand. So I find the fewer words I use, the better. Uh, but even then, I just, you know, a lot of times what happens is I'll talk to somebody and then later on I'll be thinking about the conversation and I'll figure out, you know what, I think what they were talking about and what I was talking about were to two totally different things. But I saw this guy, there's basically this, uh, there's this old guy who sits on the corner and sells some stuff. He's in a wheelchair and his son uh, sits with him a lot of the time and of course he'll push him back and forth. So he'll push him out there in the morning and the guy sits there in the shade and takes a lot of naps and sells his, uh, he basically sells little snacks like sweets and little bags of nuts and stuff. And uh, his son will take him back at the end of the day, but a lot of the times his son will sit there with him for several hours in the afternoon. And his son's probably close to my age. And he has, uh, he has this really cool German Shepherd. And the German Shepherd is always sitting there with this soccer ball, a deflated soccer ball in his mouth. And his dog never drops that ball. I don't think I've ever seen him put the ball down. He always, <laughs> the dog just always, has this deflated, full-size deflated soccer ball in his mouth. And one day I saw him sitting out there with a chihuahua. And I don't know if it was his, his girlfriend's dog or if he also has the chihuahua. I've only seen him with the chihuahua once. But after I saw him with the chihuahua, I was thinking, you know what? He needs another soccer ball for the chihuahua. So one day at the store, I bought this little, I saw this little soccer ball <laughs> that I bought for his chihuahua. And I gave it to him and I told him, uh, por tu amigo Chico. And uh, I don't know if he realized I was talking about the Chihuahua because I I don't think the Chihuahua was as heavily on his mind. I think he might have just had it with him one day. I don't even know if it was his dog, but anyway, he was very thankful. And now we're buddies. Even though that is a financial thing, it's such a small, uh, it's more about the kind of like the saying, the thought that counts, like doing something for somebody like that. Yes, it's a gift, it's a monetary thing, but 
it's something they're really going to remember. And you can do the same thing with a gesture. It doesn't have to be a gift. You could do something for somebody like I helped this old lady uh, a couple weeks ago. She was trying to get her propane. She was having a hell of a time getting her propane tank up the curb. And I carried it all the way into her uh, into her house and put it under the stairs for her. Those things are heavy, man. It had to be like 50 or 60 pounds. And uh, I also helped this guy get this big blender into his uh, bread bread business, I guess. He had this huge like stand mixer, not a blender, a stand mixer. And they were trying to get it up the stairs. I mean, just basically they were wrestling it up the curb and then they had to get up another step into the store. I helped them with that. So there's somebody who, you know, I wouldn't be surprised one day if I'm walking down the road and he gives me some free bread or something. And uh, that lady will certainly remember me. I stand out because I'm a, what they call a huero, white guy. And uh, when you do something for them, it's not necessarily expected. There is, uh, you know, there's stereotypes <clears throat> both ways between countries, between any cultures. And the stereotype, I would say, in Mexico about expats from the U.S. is one that says that would be unlikely for me to do things like that. People who have actually been around folks from the U.S., maybe if they were around some good folks, they've had that happen and maybe they don't think that way but i think a lot of folks do so they can be surprised to have an experience like that and that's important so that's what i do when i travel to kind of be in among people get friendly with people and uh another example is the mechanic down the road i like to eat rotisserie chickens uh actually the place i've been getting them from they just put them on the grill pollo asada and it's so cheap, man, but it's so good. For 149 pesos, I get two whole chickens with roast with grilled vegetables and salsa and tortillas. And uh, I can eat for two or three days off that. Um, so good. But I end up with a lot of chicken bones. So I give, they do give, I know some people, especially in the US or Canada or EU, Australia might, cringe at the thought of giving their dog cooked chicken bones, but there's no second thought about it in Mexico. So I give the chicken bones to this mechanic down the road. He has his dog out there. <clears throat> he keeps his dog. There's a shady spot on the island. I guess his dog hassles too many people if he keeps him in front of the shop. So he keeps him on the uh, median. There's a really wide median that's grass and it's got a bunch of trees on it. So he keeps his dog attached to one of those trees on the median. And I asked him one day, I said, you want some bones for your dog? So I've been giving him for months now, I've been giving him chicken bones. Uh, so there's another guy that definitely remembers me and is friendly with me. So you making friends with people like that, doing things for people is really important. I want to take it to the next level and We'll talk about this more. I've got a video topic written down that I'm going to do soon, exploring this subject some more. But uh, as I travel, I want to do more of that. I want to be in more with people. But that's, of all the stuff I talked about, that is just as important, at least as important with the stuff of being prepared as knowing people wherever you go. And I'm not doing it as a selfish act. It's just I don't know. I mean, what else am I going to do with the chicken bones? And I love dogs, so it was nothing for me to do <laughs> for me to spend 20 pesos for the guy to, you know, have a little thing for his dog to play with. So uh, anyway, that's important, guys. If you travel, don't just be, a, be an island wherever you go. You got to talk to people, even if you don't understand each other and do things for people, help people out. We're gonna talk about Soul Deep's comment. He's interested in dual citizenship also because of increasing cost of healthcare. Yeah. Um, but it's important to remember Soul Deep that you don't have to, uh, you 
yeah, cuddles, if you listen from uh, earlier in the video, I talk about water and food and money. All things that I keep plenty of on hand. I try to keep at least a month's worth of all that stuff. And I'm ramping it up even more. Uh, <clears throat> it's important, Soul Deep, to remember that you don't... Uh, you don't necessarily... So in the U.S., it's really important to have health insurance because it can cost thousands of dollars just to be in the hospital for a few days can be even tens of thousands of dollars, right? But that's not the case if you're in a lot of other countries. <clears throat> so in the U.S., you know, say you have a Say you have $100,000, that's your retirement fund or 200,000, whatever. If someone got really sick, you know, and they were in the hospital a week or two, they could easily eat through all that and even wind up owing a lot more to the hospital if they didn't have insurance. So it's unthinkable if you live in the US to not have health insurance. Now I haven't had health insurance for six years. Um, or at least, gosh, I guess it is getting close to six, five and a half right now, I think, or something like that. Basically since, uh, the summer of 20, uh, 2015 or 16, 2016. So a little over five years, I haven't had health insurance. Um, so yeah, Cuddles, we'll answer your questions in just a sec. So uh, my health insurance is taking care of myself. Uh, Trying to be in a reasonable degree of fitness and immunity, immune system and all that stuff. But as I age, that is something I think about a little more is having some backup plan even beyond that. Like maybe not necessarily waiting until I'm 65 to have, to have Medicare. Uh, and that would just, again, Medicare would probably just be something I'd be able to use in the U.S. I don't think I can use that internationally. I haven't really looked at, looked at that because it's not, it's still so many years away for me. I'm not even 50 yet. So uh, my point so deep is that if you're in other countries, I think in Mexico... Uh, gosh, what was it? Somebody told me. Say, they said 50,000. I'm pretty sure they said 50,000. So people, <laughs> I know this because, so the gal who I went out with a few times in Mexico City, she was really concerned about COVID. She was always wearing her mask. She said uh, the reason she was really scared about COVID is that if she was to get sick and have to be hospitalized, it would cost 50,000 pesos. Now, it's important to remember that for someone in Mexico, that's, that's a whole lot of money. I mean, it's a lot of money to me. That's something like $2,500 US, which for someone in Mexico could be like, that could be, uh, that could be five or six months pay. Not for her, it wouldn't be. I mean, she's uh, anyway, my point is even to her, that was a lot of money and she was someone definitely more affluent who, you know, drove, drove a VW, late model VW sedan, lived in a really nice apartment in an expensive building. Uh, but even to her, the 50,000 pesos was a lot of money. But if someone gets COVID in the U.S. and has to be hospitalized, how much does that cost? I would think it's at least 10 times that much. So my point is, while in the U.S., it could really put a dent in your nest egg. You could even go into debt over being hospitalized. If you were in another country, it's not as expensive. And like in... Uh, in uh, Asia, 
I think, uh, what's the... I shouldn't be getting too specific with these numbers because I'm just, my memory's a little foggy, but I'm pretty sure that in, uh, if you travel to Asia right now, you have to put like, in a lot of countries, you have to put $2,000 US into a bank account in certain countries to cover the cost of COVID if you were to be hospitalized. So, you know, Mexico, like 2,500 US, a lot of Asian countries, 2,000 US, but what would a COVID hospitalization typically cost in the US? It's gonna be at least 10 times that much, I imagine. So my point is, yeah, you could have health insurance, traveler's health insurance for maybe $500 a year, but you could also just have a few thousand dollars on hand in case of an emergency. Now, depending on what kind of procedure you're talking about, if you have some certain illness or some certain thing that requires a lot of care or very specialized care or something really catastrophic happens, you could need much more than that. So, of course, you'd want to have even more, but I'm just saying you may not need as much as you think. Uh, let me get caught up here. So yes, Cuddles and Daisy, I'd, I keep these, I'll just repeat real quick what I said. This is a Gara phone. This is a 20 liter water bottle. I have a few of these and uh, that represents about a month of water if I had to stretch it. And I have, uh, I'm acquiring a pile of canned food. I have a lot of cash on hand. So I've got stuff backed up and I've got I'm meeting and talking to more and more people here. So I'm establishing a network, which is also important. Are prices going up here? No. Uh, Puebla is a very affordable place to live. Soldeep says the main reason he contributed to the public employee's retirement system. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess there's a few different ways to look at that. If you work there long enough to get a pension, that's really a good thing. Um, does it bother me not having family close by? No, I'm so used to that. I mean, I guess at first, when I first moved away from, uh, when I first moved to Florida back in 2010, I moved away for a job. And yeah, I think... It took an adjustment period there, but it was also, uh, you know, it's a mixed bag. I wanted to start a new life when I moved to Florida. Uh, I changed my ways. I used to be a bit of a party animal. And uh, actually the watch I'm wearing, this is my watch I got a couple years ago to commemorate 10 years alcohol free and uh, it's about to be 12. So, you know, yeah, I miss my parents and not being close to my parents, but my brothers, <laughs> it could have been a good thing to be away from because my brothers and all my friends were bad habits, man. And whatever amount I missed being around certain family members, there was a... Uh, a benefit of not being around my old friends and you know all I did with them and with my brothers was was drink and uh, that was a good thing to get away from so that adjustment period was very short and uh, of course during uh, well I guess I actually um, you know, I made that change in the end of 2009, giving up the partying, and it was difficult. That's a whole other topic. I've talked about it before, uh, but it was actually a relief in a lot of ways to move away because relationships, if relationships are too much tied to that, they can be strained. And it's, in my experience, it's better just to move away or just cut them off and uh so there was actually a lot of relief in moving away from family and friends 
and starting over in Florida. And then, uh, of course, you know, after five years in Florida, I had my camper van all built out and was uh, leaving the rat race and getting on the road. And I never saw, I'd see family maybe, I think during the time I was in Florida, I don't even think I saw my family once a year. It was probably more like once every year and a half or two years. And then once I was traveling in my van once a year, and since I've been traveling internationally, it's about once a year. So really it's been, my frequency of seeing family has been the same for like six years now. Uh, do I miss eating ice cream with the kids? I just ate ice cream with my nephews, uh, gosh, not even two weeks ago. <clears throat> but it could be a little while before I do it again. How you doing, Cajun? Yeah, so like uh, Cuddles and Daisy says, Medicare only covers the U.S., but who cares if it's so cheap healthcare in other countries? That's why people go to other countries for it. I get my teeth cleaned here in Mexico for $30, guys. Come on. Um, I mean, everything here, super, super, super cheap. So, and this prejudice that people have or this stereotype that it's lesser healthcare in other countries, you folks need your head examined if you're thinking that way because it's far superior to the healthcare in the US. The actual care itself is just the same. And the people go through the same school and the same training and all that stuff. So as far as actual hands-on training, of course, there will be doctors or, or uh, nurses or technicians who are more skilled than others and that can cross borders and all that. But in gen generally speaking, all that's the same. What's much better in other countries is when you have an appointment set for a certain time, in Mexico or Asia and you go to the doctor, that's when you're seeing the doctor. When you, it's much more like, in my experience, it's much more like other types of businesses where in the US, doctors seem to be, think they're on some elite cloud where they don't have to, they don't have to follow the rules of treating customers right are competing in a competitive market because they don't have to compete in a competitive market. It's a rigged system where, especially because you're relying on insurance, it only covers certain doctors. You're not just picking and choosing where you go like you would in a free market. So there's the competition is removed. The doctors are a bunch of, I don't like it in the US, frankly. Can you tell? <laughs> With medical care, I mean, you have to sit around and wait. You're only talking to the nurse and you maybe see the doctor for 30 seconds at the end. He's rushed. He's trying to leave the room before he even comes in or her. And it's a terrible experience. It's not like that in other countries. So people who, and yeah, this, this bothers me because I have family members who think this way, who are, I, I get a little bit annoyed because from this uh, stereotype that is so false that medical care is inferior in other countries. The only thing that's lower about medical care in other countries is the price. And it's like 10 times, 20 times lower. So it's really a no brainer for me. Uh, yeah, Culls and Daisy, sorry, you're a little bit late to the party, honey. We've been talking about uh, this too. Uh, we'll go into more about that because I barely talked about that. So we'll talk more about that in just a minute. Uh, So yeah, Soul Deep, to wrap up the medical discussion, the last thing I'll say about it is just that have several thousand dollars in the bank and you don't have to worry about having coverage in other countries. Here in Mexico, if you have a residency card, whether it's temporary or permanent, you get to get the public health care that's paid for by taxes. You don't have to pay when you go to the doctor. It's all from tax money and you're covered by that. I guess they figure just with the fees you're paying for the residency card and to maintain the residency card and the fact that you're paying taxes within the country on other things that you're part of that system. 
And that's a really beautiful thing because a lot of other countries you have to, it's more difficult to become part of a public health system like that. Mexico, it's really easy. Uh, we're gonna jump to, uh, um, Cousin and Daisy says, do I ever worry about getting stuck in Mexico? Okay, yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about this because <clears throat> a comment I got recently about this topic is that someone said it was becoming like a, I don't want to get too much into politics, but what I'll say is someone said that they felt like it was becoming like 70s USSR in the United States. And I'm going to talk, I'm not going to talk about the United States. I'm going to talk about Russia. So whether you agree with that statement or not, uh, what would, this is someone who, that made this comment is someone who wants to be prepared in the U.S. and be ready for what's coming. And they think it's going to be some devastating thing like, you know, the turmoil that USSR went through in the 1980s after things got really bad, worse and worse. And then finally, uh, finally, things really changed in the 80s. And, uh, and then things apparently, uh, I don't know. <laughs> so... I don't like, I, again, I don't want to get too much into politics. I'm trying to think of a way to say this outside of politics. So if someone was, if someone was going to, uh, if someone was going to warn, say that they had access to a time machine. Uh, if someone doesn't like the way that things went in the former Soviet Union, in the, 60s and especially in the 70s before things you know started maybe to turn around a bit if they went say you had a time machine you could go to USSR in the 1960s and you wanted to warn people that things were going to get worse and worse would you warn them what would you tell them what would you suggest to them to do if they had the means would you suggest, A, that they stay there and tough it out for 20 years and just say things are going to get really bleak, really shitty, family members and friends are going to be killed, businesses are going to be destroyed, you're going to lose, probably a lot of people lost their homes, I'm sure, you're going to lose your fortune or your money, just tough it out for 20 years and then things are going to start to improve. Would you give them that advice just to stay there for 20 years and wait for things to get better? Or would you suggest to them, you know, maybe you just want to get out of here for a couple of decades or however long it takes. Maybe you just want to go. There's a lot of other beautiful places in the world you could see. You know, forget about this snowy, cold BS. Maybe you can go to some tropical island in Cambodia or the Philippines for 10 years if you have the means. Wait it out come back and come back after <laughs> after some leadership changes and some some things are different and things are going to be better. Would you give them that advice? Or would you give them some other advice? What other ideas do you guys have? If you were able to go warn people about the coming difficulties in some political climate, would you just ask them to sit around and hope for the best and I don't know. To me, it's kind of a, it's like, why the hell would I want to be there right now? Yeah, there is a risk in what I'm doing, but when I went back to the U.S. recently, it was like, this is just like 2016, man, or just like 20, yeah, basically just like 2016, where the whole country's divided, half the country says that the president isn't the president and that they cheated to get in there and the country can't agree on anything. And it's just, uh, 
not a pleasant uh, environment to be in, in my opinion. And when you add all this stuff up, it's like, okay, so for starters, we're going to be, no matter what side you're on, you feel like you're at odds with a lot of your neighbors. And I'm not gonna be so dramatic to say it's on the brink of civil war or something like that, but a lot of people are saying that. So we have these real difficulties that, uh, these real difficulties in the US where people aren't getting along and things are, a lot of the country feels alienated from another part of the country. And quite frankly, if the part of the country that felt alienated right now got their way, then the other half would feel alienated. So yeah, there's gotta be some coming together of people. I agree with Soul Deep that we gotta manifest uh, we got to manifest our destinies. And if that destiny is getting back together, do I want to sit around in the U.S. and wait for that to happen? <laughs> so that's one difficulty. And then another difficulty is the weather sucks. I don't like the weather in the U.S. Uh, it doesn't matter where you are. If you're in the South, you're going to be really uncomfortable in the summer. And then the winter is going to be tolerable, but then you got the summer coming right back around. If you're up north, you got, well, if you're up north, you got the brutal winter and the brutal summer. Uh, but down here where I'm at, the weather is pretty phenomenal. Uh, so you've got bad political climate, bad weather climate. <laughs> and then I could add up more things. I don't want to gripe too much about how things are in the U.S., but you got this, these difficulties, and then on top of all that, my $300 a month budget right now, it would cost me at least seven times this much to live in the U.S. So what am I paying for? What benefit do I get by spending $2,000 a month to live in the U.S. instead of 300 in Mexico. I get to understand the language that my neighbors are speaking, which that's becoming less and less difficult here day by day. I can understand this lady selling tamales. What else do I need to know about what she's saying? <laughs> she's saying she sells she sells tamales with the peppers and cream, rajas. <laughs> she sells them with, she sells them with meat. She sells them with, uh, she's just listing the varieties. So my point is, what am I getting for multiplying my budget times six or seven to be in the U.S.? To me, it feels like a headache, quite honestly. At least if I'm in Mexico and people talk uh, politics like they seem to ceaselessly do in the U.S., then I can't understand what they're saying down here. So anyway, my point on that long-winded ramble was, do I worry about getting stuck in Mexico? No. I mean, if I got stuck here, it's not a... I'm living here for a reason. Um, and yeah, it could change tomorrow where I feel like I want to be in a different place. But right now, I'm choosing to be in Mexico instead of the U.S. for all the reasons I just said. So getting stuck here, it's not, uh, stuck's not the right word. Um, and frankly, guys, I mean, if my family member didn't have the health emergency they did about two years ago, August of 2019, when I was living in Thailand, had a pretty good thing going there. Had a beautiful girlfriend, had a great apartment, really affordable lifestyle, getting massages all the time, great food, getting stuck in Thailand. I almost did. If I would have stayed in Thailand three months longer, if my family member, if I didn't have to rush back for the U.S. because of that health crisis in my family, I would have wound up stuck in Thailand throughout this whole COVID mess. And I would have been stuck in a little apartment with a beautiful woman with a really affordable budget. 
I don't know. I mean, is that stuck compared to where I was in the U.S. and the mountains in the middle of nowhere by myself? I had a miserable year of COVID in the U.S. So honestly, I think I'd rather, I would rather have been stuck. Stuck, again, isn't the right word. I would have rather been stuck in Thailand for COVID. And if we had to do that year again, I would probably rather be stuck here in Mexico than the U.S. The U.S., I think I really would feel like I was stuck. So hopefully that's a good answer to that question. Uh, we're going to go a few more minutes. If you got any other questions, please get them in. I'm starting to lose my voice, as you guys can hear. Uh, yeah, people always... Cuddles and Daisy, I'm not saying trouble isn't coming. I'm just saying you can go all the way back to since the dawn of the written word, people have been saying that. Yeah, we need to manifest our destinies, but I think part, part of manifesting the destiny for me is where I am. And maybe I'm just destined to live affordably where the weather's nice and uh, that's part of, that's the piece of my destiny is being in a comfortable climate and being able to also manifest my destiny of growing my investments, which is difficult. All that's put on hold if I'm in the US. I could build up income there, but I'd rather do it here, guys. Um, so I understand your point so deep instead of griping about the U.S. I should be talking about possibilities in Mexico. I'm just, it always comes back around to the U.S. thing because of the way that I guess that the questions are posed to where it's like, uh, you know, are you worried about the health care where you are or are you worried about being stuck there? And I have to explain to people that no i'm not worried because it's better here for me than it is in the u.s is mexico trying to force the jab there's no way they can for me uh so yeah i guess the only places i see that are forcing it are uh Yeah, so the only places I'm seeing that's forcing the vaccine, certain employers, my friend Omar, who you guys met, he had to get it for work. And then right after he did, he got laid off again. Um, is Mexico hotter being closer to the equator? No, because not where I am, because yes, you typically are gonna get warmer as you get closer to the equator, but that's not the only variable. The other variable is elevation. So yes, I'm closer to the equator than the US, but I'm at much higher elevation than your typical US city. So even Denver, the mile high city, mile high, like that's high, uh, is what, 50, 5,500, 5,600, it's a mile high. Um, so yeah, Denver I think is, a mile is 56, 25 or something like that. 5,600 feet or so above sea level is Denver. I'm at like 7,250 or something like that feet above sea level. So the temperature here is much cooler than Denver, even though I'm so much far farther south. Uh, the summers, the cool thing, the cool effect you get, Culls and Daisy, when you're at elevation down here is that you get the best of both both worlds because since you are closer to the equator the temperature is more constant year round but because you're at higher elevation the temperatures are cooler so basically what you're getting is cooler temperatures within a more compressed window where you have less you have less variability by season and you have more comfortable temperatures if that makes sense because they're cooler so I guess it all depends on personal preference but basically if you look at the temperature year-round here in Puebla the hottest it ever gets 
is like 82 Fahrenheit. And the coldest it ever gets is mid to low 40s Fahrenheit. So you're looking at like probably something like 43 to 82 year round average. I mean, of course, that's different depending on the time of year, but the coldest it ever gets is 40, low 40s, 43 or something. And the hottest is like 82. Now the caveat with that is because of the elevation, you do get a uh, really strong sun. So, you know, like when you see the videos or the movies about these people who are hiking in the Alps or somewhere and they're getting sunburned, even though they're in freezing cold, it's because they're so much closer to the sun. That makes a huge difference. So if you're out walking around in the very sunny part of the day, it could feel warmer than 82 Fahrenheit if you're in the sun and you do have to be careful about sun exposure, you know, cover up. Uh, maybe I could be a person who charges. Yeah, I don't think I'm interested in that. Thank you for the suggestion, but uh, stuck by choice. Yeah, Soul Deep understands, and Soul Deep isn't the. When I'm trying to explain things like that, I'm not trying to. Uh, <laughs> I like this one with the. Da, 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 da. You get used to these guys. You get a day off on Sunday, so yesterday they weren't out, but. Uh, Soul Deep understands, and Soul Deep isn't the isn't a specific audience when I'm making a case for what I'm doing. And when I'm making a case for what I'm doing, it's not my intention to rain on the parade of people who do understand. People who do understand, but who have different variables and different uh, goals and different perspectives than me and have therefore make different choices. I'm not trying to say their choices are bad because of the negative things for me that I talk about in the U.S. What I am doing is explaining why I made the decision I did because a lot of people try to say, not, a lot of people uh, don't understand the benefit I'm getting by being here and that's what I'm trying to explain. I think that makes sense. So uh, Soul Deep already understood, but again, that explanation is for folks who, who maybe haven't reached that uh, understanding about how things can be in other countries and all people have to do to do that is travel you know you can even just learn about places but i think the best way is to travel if you guys have any last questions now is the time uh thank you again to everybody for coming on today thank you to this month's sp sponsor on patreon brian castor thank you brian and thank you uh alex tucker and priyank bashish Reminder, you guys can do super chats. You can do uh, all that stuff on here to make a little donation if you want to the channel, or you can go join on Patreon and get all kinds of benefits, exclusive content, custom artwork, seeing the videos early without ads, all that good stuff. So thank you for watching Cajun, Soul Deep, Cuddles and Daisy, and anyone else who's in here who I don't see. You guys have any other questions after i hit that end button just post them in the comments and we'll get to them next time i'll see you guys friday for a discussion about do i regret selling my camper van thanks for watching i'll see you guys in the next video